words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Regarding the semi-professional basketball, the other members of the team, some who were really great players, would be chuckling at this point about me. I got in if we were far ahead, or far behind, or maybe if we need a little ruckus out there. <laughs> so let's spend just a moment or two with the desert dwellers. I'm thinking of a Care Crawford, who's sitting against the window over here. Initial contact with the desert dwellers can be somewhat jarring. So uh, Gary and Trevor Hudson and Lacey Borgo and, and I have been teaching and will continue to do so in a Doctor of Ministry program at Fuller. And so we decided to structure it with uh, ancient Christian spirituality, Ignatian spirituality, and Will Willardian spirituality. So I assigned what, what are known as the Apothegmata, the sayings of the Desert Fathers. These are very short pissy, oftentimes indirect sayings that are hard to make sense of, and some deeply shocking. So Care was there the first day of class. I was beginning to present this material. She wasn't smiling, and I said, well, how, what did you think about your first reading? Deliver me. <laughs> and she said on the first time through, she had taken the sayings and thrown them across the room. And now, now something has happened. I'm looking at some other folks over here. Something has happened. And what Care told me yesterday, it's very striking, that she will begin almost every day with scripture and then one of these surprising, jarring sayings. The desert dwellers are not terribly interested in theory. They're very interested in rejoicing and wondering and entering into the wonder and glory and beauty of the incarnate Son offered to them in the incarnation. Very important point now as we move into some of this stuff. When they would think of Jesus, they would think of one who invites them in their thinking sacramentally on the level of being itself into the wonder and glory of who he is. He was ontically in terms of being, in, in terms of being, in terms of being itself, being itself, not simply conceptually, but in terms of being itself, indwelling them, in them, transforming them uh, on a level of being into himself. So their expectation was, the longer you stay in a really good learning space, the more deeply you'll be formed and shaped into the image of the incarnate Lord. So there are two uh, biblical passages that came to mind for me to help us bring this to life. There's one that is often puzzling to people. At the end of Colossians chapter one, Paul writes about, do you remember this passage? You probably, you want, what's going on here? Paul speaks of filling up in his body what, what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. And we would say, there's nothing lacking. But because of their understanding of Jesus offering to his body, his body on earth, the church, 
in that offering, he is offering in union with him a very distinct cruciform pattern. A cruciform pattern, what I would call the uh, cruciform principle. Here's what I mean. Think of these words of Jesus. I'm, I'm going to try to talk like a, a desert dweller here. Think of these words of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, Father. Not my will, Father, but yours be done. That phrase, that cruciform principle caught their imagination and formed and shaped them as they moved into a very distinct learning space. That's Parker Palmer's phrase. A very distinct learning space, the Egyptian desert. Who would ever think that you would move out into the Egyptian desert to be more ever deeply formed and shaped into the image of Christ. What a strange learning space. I want to add another word to that phrase, learning space. What a strange cruciform learning space. A cruciform learning space where things that are killing us can be killed in that learning space. Things that are terribly distorting human nature can go, go there to die. Oftentimes through very specific practices. That didn't surprise them because they were caught up on the level of being itself into the wonder and glory of the crucified Lord continually offering to them, continually offering to them in their union with him, a cruciform pattern of life. What a strange thing to think that a cruciform pattern of life, where we're actively involved in killing things that are killing us, would bring deep, deep compassion, joy, love, gentleness. Abba Amonis writes this. What is the narrow and the hard way? A young monk asks him, what is the narrow and hard way? Thinking of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 7, 14. He replied, the narrow and hard way is this, to control your thoughts and to strip yourself of your own will for the sake of God. This is the meaning of the sentence. Lo, we have left everything and followed you. Let's take a moment now and then think about what might need to die in us. What might be the learning space that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in this case, particularly the incarnate Lord, who is inseparable from the Father and the Spirit, might be offering us? What are the cruciform learning spaces that have formed and shaped you? The cruciform learning spaces that have formed and shaped you. I'm in a season of loss myself. Next uh, Saturday is my mom's memorial service. Other losses in my life. A lot of you know my close friend, Gary Edmonds, once again this week had surgery to try to get rid of a cancer. He's in recovery in Phoenix. So we have these cruciform learning spaces that through the power of the spirit, the desert dwellers believe, are extruding out of us things that left to themselves will terribly distort 
and skew our ability to love. Skew, distort our ability to have compassion on someone else, to move into somebody else's world. Now, they would also ask this. This is a hard one. What are the learning spaces the kingdom of this world has offered his image bearers? The, the, the fallen king of this world is offering image bearers. I want to make sure I said that correctly. The ruler of this world is offering, they believe, continually learning spaces. Enter this space with me. I will give you everything you long for. Now, all of us have entered those learning spaces at one time or another. Huh? And it's a problem. It can drive somebody crazy. It can keep you up at night. We ask the question, how did I ever get here? What the desert dwellers would say, they, they'd come alongside, and in all likelihood, they would say, let us take you to a different learning space, the desert. What a strange learning space. Uh, earlier today, we heard about the passions. It was really good. We heard about the passions, so I'm not going to talk about the passions. I want to I narrow it down to two things that they were concerned about. The first was the bent will. The bent will. Do you remember the last time we were together? We taught, I used that Latin phrase, incurvatus in se. They were deeply concerned about a human will that because of the terribly distorting effect of human sin, here you have an image bearer meant to be in relationship with God, but, but now this will has turned in on itself, terribly bent, with the result of both uh, attitudes, emotions, habituated behaviors that consume an image bearer and deeply harm all those around that image bearer. The, the issue of the bent will. Secondly, the issue of the false self. A self that's not you, it's not me. They were deeply concerned about this. The false self. And oftentimes, in very strong language, they'll talk about the need to kill the false self. Here's the false self. Well, the big three. Money, sex, power. Along with those, things such as this. The desire to be recognized the desire to be the center of attention, the desire to become a Christian celebrity. <laughs> oh, if I could only get out on the circuit, if I could only write the book that everybody would read, and then they'd know my name. They'd know who I am. Now, the great irony is that's not who you are. So they were very interested, both for themselves and for other image bearers, to help them out at this point. Sometimes through the method of indirection, where you would go to an ama and ask her a question, she something, say something that was so strange and disorienting, you, you would wonder, why in the world, would, what is that about? And then, in all likelihood, she'd say, go away, think about it for 10 to 15 years, and come back. Now, there's a story. I was asking uh, Sam about this because my memory had failed me, and I was wondering, did I make it up because it's such a good story? No, he said, no, it's there in the literature. And uh, Antony, Antony the Great, you've probably heard that name. So there was a young monk, 
young man, oftentimes to be young is by definition you're in trouble in some way. You just haven't had time to grow. So a young monk shows up at Antony's door, knocks on the door. All the way there, the monk thinking to himself, I really like to get to know Antony. I want to spend time with Antony. All that sounds good, doesn't it? But Antony had the discernment to see what was going on. Well, in reality, what was going on? A false self was at work. I really want to get to know Antony because if I know Antony, people will see me with Antony and they'll start thinking about me. I might become well known. I might become famous. And that would be absolutely wonderful. So these, these Abbas have a gift of discernment. And so Anthony opens the door, doesn't say anything, just looks at this monk, and the young man says, Abba, uh, may I be with you? Yes. And they begin to walk. And so this young monk's walking with Anthony, other monastics on different hills and so on are watching, wondering what's going on there. And you could just see this young man, yeah, it's me and Anthony. <laughs> Aren't we a pair? So they come down to a river, and Anthony kneels down to pray. And I see this young man, right, let's kneel down together. Someone might see. So they kneel down together, and Anthony assumes a posture of prayer. The young monk kneels down next to him, not looking at God, engaging God, but engaging his false self at that point. Rad radical surgery required. He bends over, kneels over to pray, and before he knows it, Anthony has the back of his head, dumps him underwater, and won't let him up. Can you see it? I'm dying here. Yes, that's right. I'm dying here. Finally, he comes up spluttering, and he looks at Anthony with a look, what are you doing? You almost killed me. <laughs> and Anthony responds, my son, when you want God as deeply as you wanted that breath, come back. We'll talk. Now, that was the method of direction. <laughs> not the method of indirection. So we have these compulsions that are still with us. Compassion and insight and discernment and love are birthed as we die to the old self. Now the desert dwellers were equally concerned about the world that they lived in and pictured themselves in the desert, we're heading towards home, we're heading towards home, we're pilgrims on our way home, we're going to travel light in a cruciform pattern. Amma Sinclair puts it this way, those who put out to sea at first sail with a fair at first sail with a favorable wind. Then the sails spread, but later the winds become adverse. Then the ship is tossed by the waves and is no longer controlled by the rudder. But when in a little while there is a calm and the tempest dies down, then the ship sails on again. So it is with us. When we're driven by the spirits who are against us, we hold to the cross as our sail, and so we can set a safe course. Home was the kingdom of God, fully manifest in an image bearer's life who finally reached the shores. Foreign terrain was this world. 
and its attending values. Here's Thomas Merton talking about these folks. They knew that they were helpless to do any good for others as long as they floundered around in the wreckage. But once they got a foothold on solid ground, things were different. Then they had not only the power, but even the obligation to pull the whole world to safety after them. Antony predicted this, quote, a time is coming when human beings will go mad. And when they see someone who is not mad, they will attack him saying, you're mad, you're not like us. So there is a kind of madness in the desert because something's being modeled in a cruciform fashion that's real. It's real, not the madness that broader world is advocating. So there, I want to leave you today with two cruciform practices from the desert dwellers that nourish love and spiritual sanity. You're all familiar with them. Silence and solitude. The medicine for curing, among other things, deep distraction. You head out in the desert, you're not going to be distracted because there's not a lot out there. It's kind of boring. It's hot. Not a lot out there. Latin phrase. I just like this Latin phrase. Peregrinatio, pilgrimage. Peregrinatio estacere. Estacere. To be on pilgrimage is to be silent. To be on pilgrimage is to be silent. So, Henry Nouwen, who loved the image bearer, said this, solitude is the place of our salvation. Hence, it is the way where we want to lead all who are seeking the light in this dark world. St. Anthony spent 20 years in isolation. When he left it, he took his solitude with him and shared it with all who came to him. Those who saw him described him as balanced, gentle, and caring, other than probably that young monk. He had become so Christ-like, so radiant with God's love, that his entire being, his entire being was ministry, his being. So, uh, I close with this. Let me suggest that we create our own learning space in this language, our cell, a portable one. Again, I want to turn to Henry Nouwen and close with this. Silence is very concrete, practical, and a useful discipline in all our ministerial tasks. It can be seen as a portable cell taken with us from the solitary place into the place of our ministry. Silence is solitude practiced in action. Blessings.